What's up guys? Today we're going to be talking to Lucas Hex and we're going to hear his whole story. You got your number one hip-hop dad and baby DJ Cavi here. But uh, what we're going to do first is I need you to hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, and drop a comment down below. But right now, let's jump into that conversation with Lucas Hex. So I'm here with Andrew, also known as Lucas Hex, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about his career. But more, I'm really here to get the story behind Lucas Hex. How you doing? What's going on? Thank you for having me. How's, uh, how's quarantine life treating you? Uh, it's good. I'm, uh, I think you know probably about as well as anybody that I, I, I want to do like 35 different genres of music. So I've, I think I've got like four EPs of all different types of rap written trying to keep my mind occupied so I don't go crazy. But it's good. I like it. I mean, good. you know. So I want to dive into of the course. story of Lucas X. But um, I want to go all the way back. Right. So before we okay. knew each other, uh, you were just a, okay. a little baby rapper. All right. So the first time I ever told this story and I, it, I felt a little weird doing it. Um, but I, I, I think I'm coming to grips with it. But the first time I told it was when I did that, uh, when I did Lissa's uh, local music podcast. So we ended up in South, I was born in Connecticut. Um, my mother got knocked up from my father. It was like a first love prom night accident type of thing. He was like a really douchey, but well-respected, uh, like rich kid. And my mom was like gutter trash. So he came to her and he told her, get rid of the baby. She said, no, he showed up with a gun and threatened to kill her. She still said no. Then he tried to run her off the road. So she packed her bags like in the dead of the night and, uh, went to Virginia because that's where my aunt was staying. Um, so we moved to Virginia. Uh, she met a dude who is my brother's father. Um, and they got married. We moved uh, uh, from Virginia to Florida and then North Carolina for like a cup of coffee and then South Carolina and then from South Carolina, obviously, to Scranton and, you know, to Pennsylvania. Um, and uh, the whole time she, my mom, she, I mean, God love her. She'll tell you she can sing, but it's, it's an atrocious sound to listen to, but she really loves music. She's always been really musical. Um, I'm not going to make it sound like I grew up with rap in the house. I mean, cause she was, a you know, single white woman from Connecticut. She liked like Madonna and Barry Manilow and stuff. But, um, in South Carolina, I got, um, introduced basically the way the G the, the, uh, geography of it was set up. It was, we lived in a trailer park that almost had a moat of like public housing. So it was just like, and then there was like this big razor wire fence that you could hop and you would get to like, what would almost be like route six, but route six with like really nice houses. So it felt like the have and the have not separated by this like razor wire fence. We used to try to climb it all the time and get caught up in it. So I got introduced to a bunch of different, um, different, kids from different backgrounds and different stories and and um I was like one of three white kids in the whole school and then uh one of them left and it was like two of us and uh so I got introduced to rap and um I'll never forget there was this kid uh he brought a knife to school because this kid was dating his girlfriend we were like 10 or 11 years old this kid was dating his girlfriend and he brought a knife to school to stab him they caught him they kicked him out he lived in the trailer park with us. So when we got home from school, he had stolen his brother's uh, Snoop Dogg doggy style CD. It had just come out like a year or two before, whatever it was. And he was playing it. And I just remember it's, it's so easy to look back on things with hindsight, obviously. At hindsight, you make them more cinematic than they are. But do you know when something just kind of clicks? Like it doesn't have to be rap or indie music, pop punk, like whatever the thing is that speaks to your soul, the thing clicks. Mm -hmm. And um, I was like, oh, this is way better than Madonna and Barry Manilow that my mom plays. And um, so I kind of started, again, I'm young, so it's not like I can go and get music. So I kind of, mm -hmm. other people are playing things for me. I'm hearing, you know, Tupac and Biggie and Mob Deep and things like that. And I, and I loved it. Um, and it felt like, it made sense to me because my mom was really good about, to this day, my mom is still 
pretty broke and she's but she she can like make twelve hundred dollars a, a, a month or or it's honestly probably even less and back then it was less but um she'll make the smallest amount of money go so far so it's one of those things where when you're a kid you don't really realize you're poor i mean because especially back then like pay less wasn't like it wasn't cool to go thrifting. Like I was beat up because my jeans had holes in them. And like, but you just think like, oh, this is where we shop for clothes, the Salvation Army. This is just a clothes shop. And uh, again, it's I'm it's probably hard for people to remember or whatever, but like air walks weren't cool. You were like a scumbag because you couldn't afford like a Nike. You got like a $15 pair of air walks from Payless before Payless raised the prices. And um, but you don't think of that you know what I mean and she was so good about making sure we could eat but then you look back on it and you're like oh there were like roaches everywhere and it was disgusting and it was you know I do remember her crying in her room with her door shut as a kid and I do remember stealing a can of ravioli because like my mom was gone and my brother didn't have anything to eat and like the men that she was dating were garbage the music like it just felt like something I understood not that I was 10 years old like selling all this crack like you know biggie talks about but just the struggle spoke to me right but and again people will tell me i'm wrong because i know there were some white rappers but for the most part until eminem came along you, there was still there still is a stigma on white rappers i mean like it's weird because they always say like a white rapper will have a really hard time breaking through and i'm not talking about like the slim jesuses and the little zans of the world that are garbage and here for six minutes i mean like someone that wants to make an impact on the culture it's hard to break through, but then there's the unfair advantage of once you break through, you sell higher than anybody else. And it's, you know, that's a whole conversation, whatever. But, um, but the idea of this white kid rapping that had just moved up to Scranton and like, I didn't even know how to rap. Obviously you remember, you couldn't just buy a mic and a MacBook and make an, a music empire back then, you know? So like that's, but, I, I was writing songs and lyrics from that early age. And my uncle was really into like uh, heavy metal. Like, I mean, he's, he's in like his fifties now. So his heavy metal was like Kiss and early Metallica and stuff. But um, so I kind of started gravitating towards that because to be very honest, those people looked like me. And I was like, oh, well that, is something I can do. And I wanted to perform. I used to like lock the, uh, lock my bedroom door and like jump around and like sing like songs on my stereo, whether it was rap or like metal once my uncle gave me like my first kiss tape and stuff. So I wanted to perform. So that's kind of how I got into metal was because then I was like, Oh, well, this is, this makes sense for me, I guess. And, um, then my mom met the, uh, Gary who is, I consider my father, he's been around for so long. And um, we moved to the suburbs and I was like, oh, everything is like. I can't rap now. I'm, we live in the suburbs. And like every, like what, I have Christmas presents now. Like I can't, what? And again, this is a very short sighted point of view, but you know, you're 14. 15. Yeah, you're a kid. Yeah. yeah. Your, wor uh, your, your worldview is shaped by your surroundings at that point. Exactly. Yep. So I, but I still wanted to perform and write and I've always, you know, liked writing. I think even once I, if, if, you know, God forbid, if I ever stop recording, I don't know if I'll ever stop or stop releasing. I don't know if I'll ever stop recording or writing, but, um, so I got into metal bands cause I wanted to perform. Yeah. Obviously we played for a few years. You, you, you booked us, you helped us in, 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 especially in aesthetic, but, um, uh, that broke up because like every, you know, 19 year olds, we couldn't stand each other anymore. And I was like, it's, it's time. I was like 20 years old. And I was like, it's again, at 20 years old, you think your life is over because you're, you think you're old now. Cause you're not in high school, but I was like, it's now or never like, so pull the trigger or don't. And then I still didn't pull the trigger for another like two years. You know what I mean? But I was like, it's hard to explain, but when I really tap into a certain place and I like one of the, it's so funny to say one of the EPs I wrote over quarantine is um it's definitely way more like boom bappy and it's I really tapped into some uncomfortable subjects for myself um from being a kid and and those times when like my mom was crying because she could each only get my brother and I like two presents and I you know was like 
eight and said like, where's the rest? Cause you know what I mean? Like I, and, and, and it's, I, I guess you could do that with metal and I'm sure you can and people will say you can, but those specific experiences, I'm not good enough to write them. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Other than in a very blatant, like saw my mama cry type of way, you know what I mean? And, um, I'm always so afraid with how I'm coming off because I don't want people to think I'm disrespecting metal or hip hop saying that either one is easy to write because they're both ridiculously hard and have their own challenges. I love yeah, when metal. I, I don't think it comes that. across like that at all. Yeah, I think, I think uh, I've always seen hip hop um, almost on a level of poetry. But yeah, I definitely like, I've always had this like unfounded respect and interest in, in hip hop as a genre. So like, that's what excites me about everything. Like when I, when we work together, cause I think you're phenomenal at it. And, uh, Thank you. it takes me out of my comfort level. You know, like I come from the, the, the punk rock metal heavy music, um, background and that's where I've like cut my teeth, but I, I enjoy the challenge, um, of being outside my comfort zone when, when we do stuff together. So mm -hmm. I appreciated that. I, I appreciate that. I, I appreciate that too. And I, I do, I appreciate, um, like that, that you did that. Cause I, I appreciate that you do appreciate hip hop, but that you also did cut your teeth. I've been thinking of the way I wanted to say this the whole time before we've done this call, but I appreciate that you appreciate hip hop and that you let me do my thing, no matter how far out it goes sometimes which we've had the conversation before about people calling things niche, but like certain niches are making millions of dollars a year. But, um, but like there's a hustle that, that you cutting your teeth in the punk rock world and the, the going on tours. I mean, we've talked about it. Like rappers didn't even really have to tour until like 10 years ago it, and maybe even a little less, but you know what I mean? Whereas like, you know, like uh, uh, I Am Legend, you went on tour with them for your first tour. So there's, there's definitely, a, there's just like a different level of grind that you, you got from cutting your teeth on that. And it's, and I, I think it's unique to what it, it brings us together when, yeah. when we do like do stuff together. I was even thinking about how, how much I've learned from from when we first started working together and it's like like i mean what was it four or five years ago i guess really after that four years ago maybe after that music conference when yeah. kenny first started meeting potato and i like i didn't even know what a manager was supposed to do because like you don't people don't like get managers until it seems it's just like the way we talk about labels no one wants to sign you until you're too big to want them anyway so i didn't think anybody gets managers until they're worth it so i didn't realize like in the beginning like and it's totally on me and this is like my my formal apology essentially but i didn't realize that it like had to be a, a partnership i thought the manager just kind of like came in and made things easier and now listen obviously if i was drake everyone would have to answer my calls no matter what fucking time it was. And if they were fucking, they'd have to pick up my phone calls, but like at nobody like work at the grocery store level, I didn't realize it had to be like a, a partnership. So I, I apologize for that. And it's, it's no taught problem. me a ton about like what I need to bring to the table and what I need to do. So like, I appreciate what I've learned from us working together. So I was, uh, I was sitting down, I was trying to think, I'm like, what was the first time like that I like that we met or like like interacted right and where I'm I go back to um like I, I like my memory works in moments so like I know that uh I remember communicating with you through MySpace yes and yes. it was it was aesthetic mm -hmm. and uh you were so persistent you were just like you work with Melded I want to work with you. Like, I want to do something. I want to do something. And like, at that point in my life, I had no appreciation for heavy music whatsoever. But you, I remember you just messaged me and like, I just remember like looking at like the like scary logo <laughs> being like, I don't want, like, I just don't even want anything to do with this, you know? And I remember blowing you off a bunch on MySpace, And then you hit me with a, like a song and you were like, will you design the cover art for this? Yeah. I was like, cool. Like, yeah, there's like 25 bucks or whatever. You know, I was a broke college kid. 
So I was like, yeah, I'll do that. And uh, the artwork ended up being like a, a, a fetus in the womb mm-hmm. with like the umbilical cord. Because it was for an EP and the EP name was Rebirth. Rebirth, right. <laughs> I remember it distinctly. Like that was the first thing I ever had like go to print. Like, so that was like a, a huge moment for me. And then like, I just like really dug the band and that was kind of my intro to that type of music. We always liked playing mixed genre shows. So like, even if being on like the burnt carbon roster meant like an occasional VFW show with Melded, we were stoked. Like it was, you know what I mean? We were just like being 17 yeah. and like enjoying ourselves. I think it's also, it's hard to, again, like everything feels like a learning experience, but it's, it, it's, it doesn't seem like an easy job. I mean, like, we're obviously all sensitive about our shit. Like, whether it sucks or it's great, we're all sensitive about it. And then, like, let's be honest, nobody's really setting the world on fire numbers-wise, so that's an added level of pressure for us. And then when, when you come in to, like, set something up or do something, we don't understand why, like, it can't be done this way because this is the way I want it to be done, but it doesn't make any goddamn logistical sense. And I'm sensitive as fuck. I get mad if, like, if I get a thumbs up response, I'm upset for like three days. I'm like, this motherfucker doesn't care about me. No, <laughs> you can't send me an okay. All right, motherfucker. <laughs> like, so like, I'm not fun to work with. Like, I, <laughs> it's it's easier that way. <laughs> but I am always in the background doing whatever I can. So, well, it's honestly even me being the age I am, it's still for sure better to. Uh, uh, under promise over deliver because you can be 40 years old if you've been doing this forever you still get your feelings hurt I might get my feelings hurt less than a younger act or whatever but like they definitely still get hurt you know what I mean the day when we had to cancel the riffraff well and that goes to your point we didn't talk for like almost a month and then we got the riffraff tour like can you call me up one day and said like can you do three or more days with riffraff like but like the day we had to cancel because of a national or global pandemic I still spent like two hours like motherfucker, man, that was going to be really sick. You know what I mean? And that, that's not like on you, obviously who can control people eating pangolins or bats, but like right. fucking, it still like bums you out. You can't help it. You're like, Oh my God, finally. Like, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, that was, uh, I don't know that I've ever put anybody on tour or had as big of an opportunity for anybody as that. Like, like for me, that was like, uh obviously a huge accomplishment for you because i'm always working for you but like i'm like of a personal like notch in my belt or however you want to put it like Mm -hmm. i was stoked on that like he Mm -hmm. riffraff's big (laughs) like you know people could say what they want but he's big maybe you're not into it but he's like a celebrity yeah i mean what are we looking at five to seven hundred people a night like come on yep (sighs) great sold out shows yeah you were going by drew Brees at the time yep and you had done your first music video. And I was like, this is really, really, like, I really liked, I like, I, to this day like that. I think you're like, maybe in the elevator by the Steamtown Mall, like parking garage or something. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So like, like, I, I, I loved that song. And then I think like shortly after that, you put out the song with Dan Rosler. Mm-hmm. You've gone through a couple, <laughs> you've, you've, you've gone through a couple iterations of me uh losing my mind and not being sure because the night you decided that you wanted to work with me i was uh wearing a modified Corey taylor mask with a light box on stage and um and uh but hadn't switched my music catalog over yet so the show looked like a death metal show uh and and the rap sounded like somebody trying to be somebody else so you've had to like go through a couple stages with me of me fi- figuring things out. So that was one of the things like, like you were saying about like letting people do their thing. I hated the mask. <laughs> it was a cool mask. I just hated the idea of it. I also so, think you were going to die in it if you kept doing shows in it. If one of the selling points of me might be that people think I'm cute. I'm not saying that's what it is, but like, why would I put on a mask? Like you can't do everything you want to do. Sometimes you have to look at the business and I wasn't doing that. And I, again, another formal apology <laughs> um, it's all right it didn't last that long so it, it, no. it never uh it never even got to a point i think that i had to address it it was like i came to one show you had it on the next one i came to you didn't so i was like uh, mm-hmm. uh, um, yeah because after like three songs i had to take it off because i couldn't breathe in it and i couldn't stomp and i was like if i can't stomp i don't want to wear this, this is <laughs> right <ridiculous. laughs> we we kind of veered off track but so you moved to scranton mm-hmm. or uh the valley 
near mm-hmm. Scranton, right? And uh, well, Scranton, and then yes, then we came to the valley, right? And you were a, a dome kid. Mm-hmm. So talk about like the the influence that that music scene kind of had on you. It it it, it had a it had a, a really big one, both good and bad. Good because it everyone was so it was so supportive and uh it might be easier to start it like this it's good and bad because on a wednesday night and i want everyone to know i'm not kidding whatsoever on a wednesday night you could have at in a sports dome you could have a hundred kids and i'm that's a wednesday you could play a friday or a saturday sometimes and have way more than that and i'm talking like 17 18 year old bands that have not been on tour don't have a press kit like none of that happy horse shit you just like show up and play to 150 or 200 kids or like dome fest was like a few hundred like so it was good because it taught me to play and like maybe that i if nothing else i have a knack for a stage presence maybe but it was bad because it's truthfully it spoiled me i didn't realize that's not what the average local show is until the dome collapsed and like so many other ways. You have to work so much harder to get people to come out, or at least you did. And and now uh, after this, who even knows what what that landscape looks like now? I know. How much harder you're gonna have to work for people to come out um, when health yeah. is involved. I think what I've always, because um, even now with some of the 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 poppier stuff I've written, like I guess I don't know if it's because of like my voice or the way that like I look like I would have cost you in the alley. I always saw myself as someone that would like get more of like get more of a cult following. Like I don't I feel like I'm like rough pretty. Like most of the people in like the mainstream art don't have like a ton of moles and like a couple prison tattoos and like this voice like the 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 drakes and the macklemores of the world look very pristine so i've never felt like i was gonna like like could you really see me on mtv too now i could see myself selling out a tour across the country and getting paid in brown paper bags and that happens for people that would never make it on mtv all day but could you really see me on MTV? Because I don't know if I could. I can see you on Fuse, or not Fuse. Um, I don't think that's a thing anymore. Uh, on Vice. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Like exactly. Action Bronson and 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 uh, Two Chains and and yeah. that. Like, I think that's more of your home. Like the uh, yeah. like it, it's funny because I don't know that there is that that a, a true underground exists anymore. I just of don't course. think it does. Um, but like in theory as successful as Action Bronson is. And he, he's attained a little bit of celebrity now, whereas, like, I think a lot of people that, that, like, fuck with him don't even probably know that he does music. They just think he, like, eats, you know, type of deal, like, from his yeah. shows and stuff. But I still, like, I would, like, 20 years ago, like, I would consider him underground still, even though he's, like, playing festivals and everything like that, you know, in comparison to, like, a mainstream artist. Action Bronson doesn't seem like a terrible gig. I'm sure his manager makes, like a hundred grand a year or something, but he doesn't have to nearly answer the phone calls that Drake's manager does. So, so here, like, honestly, my, as a, as a, from a managerial standpoint, and I think musicians should look at it the same way. Like, it's really cool to like have a hit and blow up and be like the biggest thing in the world. But I feel like that's less sustainable than like a cult following. Cause I used to think when I was younger, like, especially metal bands. Cause again, you had to be a road dog back then. I was like, I'll, yeah. I'll, like I didn't have like a, a girlfriend that was genuinely serious about it. And I was like, I'll, I'll stay on tour 11 months a year. Get me the fucking van and the metal blades record contract. I'll fucking go, you yeah. know? But now I keep thinking like, would I rather be like, and I know people are going to say I'm crazy, but would I rather be like a millionaire that's never home or like a 300,000 a year heir that like gets to see like my girl and like, I don't know, maybe like, do a commercial if like we're broke i don't know right. like i d- I, th- I think getting to the point where you're allowed to be selective is is a great thing mm-hmm. you know i think that's a that's a really good uh a good spot to be you know not having to do everything but when you do do it there's a want and a uh when did you actually sit down and be like okay well first of all how did you come up with the name drew Brees? i mean <laughs> obviously your name's andrew but yeah what, what um, when were you like this is a good idea i had like 
never, I'd always written raps, but they were like garbage, never thought they'd be serious. So if they fizzled out four lines in, who cares? But I like played the first beat and it was for that song, Look At Me Now with that video, I was in the elevator. And it just like, I just like started rapping to it as it came on and like that hook came to me instantly. And I was like, oh fuck maybe I'm not terrible at this. Let's see. And I wrote like whatever was on that first Drew Brees mixtape. Um, it was like 11 songs. I wrote them in like the course of a weekend. Now, granted, again, I was, I was, that was, I was still all messed up on drugs and stuff. So I just locked myself in my living room. And I was just rocked all weekend writing 11 songs. And at the end of it, I was like, I, I think I should record these. I asked a friend, like, where do you record? And someone said, like, oh, this studio. And I messaged them, and they were like, oh, 100 bucks an hour. And I was like, these songs might suck. There's no way I'm spending that again. <laughs> yeah. Like, I don't even know if this is good or not. What? Right, right, right. And, um, and then I found the kid, obviously, the first basement studio I ever went to. You know what I mean? And it was obviously subpar and shit. But, um, but yeah, it was crazy, man. There was, like, a feeling... I'll never forget it. And like, I'm so happy to be like clean and stuff, obviously, but like, so taking out the glorifying of the using and stuff, there was a feeling that weekend when everything just kept coming to me, kept coming to me. And I was like, I'm fucking, I'm, I, I, I'm writing, like I'd, I'd stay up to like 3 a.m., uh, 4 a.m. And I'd wake up at like nine or 10 and I'd like, crush one and I'd get back on sound click and I'd just start writing and like everything was uh in Microsoft Word because like we didn't have like a notepad in our phone yet and um and I was like I'm fucking writing a a, a, a mixtape this is insane like that feeling was so like pure almost for mm -hmm. lack of like a less corny term there yeah. was just something so like pure and artistic about it that like maybe that's why I constantly write things because like I'm chasing it like I'm still chasing a dragon but like I loved it man that's awesome though. Well, I mean, it, it's, I definitely know that feeling and I know the, the chase of it. You know what I mean? Like, like I remember booking like the first tour I ever booked and I remember sitting there, MySpace was still a thing for like 12 hours one night. Like I remember watching the sun come up, but like emailing, you know, with some like fake hype and, and like, I definitely like chase that feeling to this day with everything I do. And then like, say they like your your show was was sick like that was awesome and, and it was cool like uh that your mom was there and stuff and yeah. like i like i i was so pumped on that show you know i thought that was really I cool i know yeah she had never seen me rap before that night that was that was that was really cool that was i know oh but again it's hard because then it's like in a in a very grateful way you almost get like i I was like afraid, well, number, obviously I was afraid that night because I was like, fuck, are, like, are people going to show up? Because we just did like a free show, just come. So we didn't know, you know, obviously we gave out tickets, but who knows if they're going to throw them away or not. So I was terrified that night, but then I was so scared to do a show after that because I was like, how, that was so great. How do I go, go back to 30 people at the Wolf Pub? You know what I mean? Right, like, right. Yeah. How do I do it? And that's, but to be fair though, I feel like again, in a very, crystally like massage type of way like the everything happens for a reason we did kind of get more selective and we saved ourselves from a couple things that we don't even need to say because then they don't need to be cut out but we saved ourselves from a couple of things yeah no 100 percent. i might have looked like a dick for saying no but like we saved ourselves like no i i completely agree and it's it's your uh i mean everything's a product at the end of the day, you know, and you're, 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 you're a product, you know? So it's like, how do you want it to be marketed and perceived? And I just bring you whatever, and then uh, let you kind of make your decisions on, on what you think with that, you know? And I think that that's worked out really well for us. Like, I don't expect anything like, fuck, honestly, I even like the 30 people at the wolf, but like, I don't expect anything. I'm even, I'm grateful for that. You know what I mean? Like I'm, yeah. I'm so I do feel bad when I say no, so it's good to hear you say that because I don't. Oh yeah, but, yeah, no, and I and I I definitely get that tone. I just uh I just I, I'm always gonna bring it, at least oh. to your attention, so that you you know you know. So we uh, talking stuff we didn't turn down though. We did the uh, Michael Barr tour. Yeah, man, that was fun. He cool, he right? was a, he was a dick, 
and he is a little bit of a dick to me now on social media because he's back in volume, so he's famous again. Man, that was fun. It was really fucking fun. Like, I don't know. It sounds so stupid, but like, it was like the, I don't know, maybe it's like, cause it's like the stuff I saw when I was a kid. Cause I'm obsessed with like documentaries. I always have been like tour documentaries. And I always remember seeing like rappers or bands or whatever, like in like their sweats all day, just like bumming around, like smoking or eating or like, we have to run to CVS, but then like getting ready for the show and then like playing the show. Like it was just so like, I don't know. It was just so fucking funny. I almost felt like I was like playing dress up, even though like, yeah. They, oh yeah. There was people came up to me afterwards. People loved it. People like people, it was, and it was cool, man. It was fun. Yeah. It was, it was fun. I, um, I guess it's so weird. You never know what, you know, you never know. Cause like, even like, um, like two days ago, I had like four people hit me up on Twitter. There's someone put out a thing like, who are your favorite unsigned Pennsylvania rappers? And like four people that I've like literally don't follow, don't follow me. Like people I don't know, like mentioned me as like that person. And I was like, who the fuck are these people? And then like, um some people came to the um Schwazy show because they um saw me in the weekender for my release show because it had only been a few weeks in between those um what i'm getting at is, is it's so weird the the people you kind of pick up along the way that are like oh i i think that shit's cool like it's uh it's interesting i think it's uh like the the way that hip-hop is consumed is definitely different and that's that that's what interests me a lot in it like like i honestly think like like you and i had that conversation and that's where it kind of like i obviously come to things from the the diy rock and roll mindset and then when you and i like you kind of like bring me into like this is how hip-hop works and it's like we don't need to play a show every month Mm mm-hmm you know, we, we, but we need to keep our social media up and we need to keep our internet presence up. And it's like more a content thing, which is like, like you've definitely shaped the way I do some things that way too. Like with everybody, like that's translated to the way everybody I work with now. Cause I'm like, you know what? Like, yeah, like rock and roll, we should be on the road and it's, it's a little different like doing that. But at the same time, like if, if there's a formula that's making hip hop work on the internet, that should work for everybody. So guys, that was Lucas Hex. Thank you for tuning in. Hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, and uh, go follow him on his social media. Why don't you drop that real quick? Uh, LucasHex570 on Instagram and Twitter, which from there you can find everything else. And it's just LucasHex, spelled how it sounds, L-U-C-A-S-H-E-X. Spotify, iTunes, Apple, everywhere the music is, I'm on there. Plug the new song, too. Oh, yeah, Bloodshot dropped today. We... um, I don't know if it's going to make it into the end conversation, but Facebook screwed me and I can't uh, put an ad on it so that other people get to hear it. But Bloodshot dropped today. It's kind of a trappier song, even though the last song was a, a poppy song. Gia said that um, people need a uh, crushing beers with the bros songs. So I put out Bloodshot and uh, uh, it's just fun. You know, it's about Yankee candles for whores and things like that. So go check it out. Cool. Hey man, thank you very much. Thank you. See you soon. All right. Okay.